This episode brought to you by ExpressVPN, the best VPN there is. Take back your online privacy today. Nostalgia critic guy, remember it so you don't have to. You clicked on the video, you know what time it is. Play that cheesy ass graphic! <laughs> Stephen King, you've brought so much joy into our lives. Not that his creativity hasn't delighted and inspired several generations now, but he's one of the few writers where his bad works are just as entertaining as his good works. When he goes for something, he goes big with it. And even though there's more Stephen King stories than there probably are Pokemon, people forget that a Stephen King project, even if it was bad, was often a big event. Yeah, some didn't get a ton of press, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard people hyped for the latest film or series that had his name attached to it. Langoliers, Shining, Carrie, Tommyknockers. Hell, it was a big deal twice. Three times, uh, twice. And by far one of the most hyped miniseries, if not the most hyped miniseries, The Stand. <laughs> Based on his book about the size of five Bibles, with notes from Fox News, The Stand was an instant hit when it premiered in 1994. And unlike some of his other hit miniseries which received mixed to negative reactions after watching them, The Stand was phenomenally well received. Yes, this is one of the few Stephen King miniseries that audiences and critics liked from beginning to end. And with the series running a whopping six hours and that's taking out commercial breaks, that's no small feat. The series was directed by Mick Garris and penned by King himself. And while their collaborations have been <laughs> memorable to say the least, this truly is among their best work. So you might be wondering, how am I gonna get that much material out of such a universally beloved series? It is still Stephen King and Mick Garris, guys. One of the things I love about these two is they go all out, which means they take more risks, which means there's always great, hilarious head scratching moments. And God bless every one of them. But at six hours, I gotta stop yapping and hop right into this. So let's jump right into it. This is oh, the- Critic, you must make your way to my home. No, sorry, Mother Abigail. I got too much series to review. But it's very important. I waited minutes in makeup for this. Minutes! Sorry, but I got way too much to get through. And that includes you too, Tamara. No, oh, that's fine. Um, what? What are you working on? I thought you said you were busy. Right, right. This is the stand. Early taxes? Six or... hours, man. You're right, you're right. Ah, great check. Torrance wrote the screenplay. I thought this property had a restraining order against Garrus. The film opens with a deadly virus being released and the government trying to downplay it. Ha! Fiction! As one of the last surviving guards at a U.S. reservation, it's told to lock up the gate, but he chooses to get his family out. Use the manual gate override, Campion! Do it now! Do it now! Sorry, I can't follow unless you say that in your Arnold voice. Alright, fine. Do it now! Got it. <laughs> Their child throws a doll out the window. <gasps> Dumb kid. And the credits roll to this very eerie imagery of all the people on the base dead while the radio plays. Half of them were rushing to shout, <laughs> More cowbell! Later that night, the car is out of control, crashing into a nearby gas station. Yeah, he looks safe to touch. Put your head down. Maybe it's food poisoning. You know, he's got California plates here, maybe. To be fair, we did just eat at Boston Market. 
The guard dies, but another base is trying its best to keep the virus under control. It's helmed by General Starkey, played by Ed Harris. This stuff has a communicability level of over 99%. Most people are gonna think they've got the plain old non-lethal flu right up to the very end. Boy, am I glad this is taking my mind off the news! I couldn't come up with something funnier than that, so I just stole it from the Snobs Review. I so want a King Project just titled Southern Accents. And then there's been three more big transport planes land over Starland in Arkansas. Was, Carter. I knew it was. A nearby town in Texas is told about the deadly disease and how they have to quarantine. <laughs> Maybe I ought to close up the station for the rest of the day. All right, but don't you wear a mask. That's how you catch the communism. As expected, the town goes into lockdown, and the man who helped the sick driver named Stu, played by Gary Sinise, is forced into quarantine. I insist you get into the truck right now, or... What? You shoot me? No, your name's in the opening credits. If you had an and or a with on top, then your ass would be applesauce. Meanwhile, an upcoming singer named Larry Underwood, played by Adam Stroke, is visiting his mother because despite his song rising in the charts, he's still financially struggling. This will clearly be the worst problem of his week. You heard it, right? Of course I have. You sound black. Oh. That brown sound sure do get around. I get the feeling they're gonna cut that from the remake. Happy Paholian. Don't lie. About 40,000. Jesus wept. Hey, how'd you know what the album's called? At a nearby base, doctors observe the last breaths of patients with the virus. Ah, this is interesting. Now watch this. Shouldn't we help him? He doesn't have insurance. Ah. Uh, it's so damn quick. Well, we suck as doctors. Want to see if that elf specimen ate those kittens yet? Sure. Let's be horrible vets, too. Meanwhile in... Ah, uh, I knew you'd make it! A young woman named Fran, played by Molly Ringwald, and her father, played by Ken Jenkins, are somewhat put off as the local geek Harold, played by Corin Nemec, keeps trying to hit on Fran. I was wondering if you would care to accompany me to the Railroad Cinema. Oh. They're having a Bergman festival. I've always found cries and whispers to be especially moving. I'm a seventh seal kind of girl. Hey, I really... no, don't worry about it. It's okay. No. I understand, really. I hope you enjoy the poem I and will. the rest of the magazine, of course. Oh, get out of here, pizza face. Calling you that because you have literal pizza on your face. Those aren't supposed to be zits, are they? You won an Emmy for best makeup! Elsewhere in Arkansas, a young deaf man named Nick, played by Rob Lowe, is beaten up by some bullies with not the best choreograph fighting. Move him on the sucker! Oh! <laughs> when the fights on Star Trek are looking more real, you might want to do a few more takes. Nick gets knocked out and dreams that he's in a cornfield where he can hear and talk. Asshole, don't look behind the rows! Ha! Some reviews are above making a Children of the Corn reference, but I'll always be that desperate! I can hear! I can talk! I can sing! Thus we're introduced to easily the most memorable character, Mother Abigail, played by Ruby D. You come see me, Nick. You and all your friends. You got to hurry, though. There's... A lot to discuss about her. You must make your way to the- But we'll do it when they reveal more about her character. Oh, shoot. Mother Abigail, you're what, five feet? And shrinking, darling. Thank you. I still don't get what you- Okay. Nick wakes up in the local jail where a sheriff and a medic try to find the people who jumped in. Did I mention the series is a flame to every 90s character acting moth? One of them had a ring like that? Ray Booth, our town bad boy. Welcome to Chicago. Laughing and coughing. Always a great duo for a long life in horror. Back in Vermont, doctors in their dinosaur cookie suits continue to study Stu, who is 100% healthy despite him testing positive for the virus. I don't know how many different ways I can say this. This so-called super flu does not exist. And if it did, it would probably wipe itself out by Easter. How many times do I have to tell you I don't have the measles? I'm not responsible for you being here. Then who is? No one. Everyone. God. <laughs> Spoilers. You talk about this thing in here like you were outside of it. I just wanted you to get a little taste of what it's like on the inside. So one of the things you'll notice in this miniseries is the acting is actually pretty good. Don't get me wrong, it's still miniseries acting, but as miniseries at the time go, it's pretty engaging and believable. Whoever casted this should have gotten an award of some kind. 
But with that said, it does make the more hokey actors stand out a bit. I'm sorry, man. The rat man forgive you this time. Never mind him, he's late for a sketch on In Living Color. And speaking of random people appearing... He's coming for you, Larry. What? The man with no face. I know you. You're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. No shit, kid. At least in that movie they call attention to it and he was one of the major players. Here, he has this scene and a few brief moments where he's just yelling about the apocalypse. That's it. It's one of the most hilariously distracting cameos I've seen in anything. Bring out your dick! No, no, I don't see a performance at all. I only see a homeless man who's completely believable screaming on the street. I see Kareem Abdul-Jabbar! How in God's name am I not supposed to see that? He just doesn't have the chops to disappear that well into a role. The hell I don't. Back in Arkansas, the men who beat up Nick are arrested, and Nick himself has been promoted to... Deputy? I'm sorry. John and his wife are dead. Well, I guess you're the sheriff now. And here I thought politics would work a little different in Arkansas. No, I didn't. The medic tells him they should take off out of town before the virus gets to them, but Nick is nice enough to let the inmates go before he leaves. As the medic predicted, the world starts going to shit as more and more people die and those who want answers start riots. <laughs> This is the life. Filled with grief, the general shoots himself for lying to the people. Nick is forced to shoot his attacker with no gun flash. <laughs> you should have seen the director's cut. <laughs> and even radio hosts from Cameo FM are under siege. Shut it down! You ever heard of a little number called freedom of speech? <laughs> okay, cancel culture's definitely gone too far. Almost everyone dies at the disease center, so Stu decides to break out before the crazy doctor left ends his life too. Just like Nick, he gets a vision from Mother Abigail. The beast is loose in the streets of Bethlehem. The rats are in the corn. And the makeup on my arm ain't done yet. Emmy! All right, here's a jump scarecrow to get you back on track. If I only had your soul! Stu decides to find Mother Abigail right after this bit of weirdness. Come down and eat chicken with me, beautiful. It's so dark. Famous last words? <laughs> and we see Fran's father has passed away from the virus as well. I love you, Daddy. I don't care what the internet says. Scrubs was funny as it was move. It was funny. Fran? Hey, remember when you said you wouldn't date me unless we were the last two people on Earth? To both be immune to something this big, it has to mean something. Well, there's gotta be other people. Oh, let's hope not. Oh, I mean the uh, opposite of that. Do you think that maybe, you know, maybe I could be... Harold, we're always gonna be friends. Yeah, friends always listen to romantic songs on record and put their heads on each other's knees. Christ, Harold's crotch must be five seconds away from... Hello? Has anyone heard my song? If I'm the last musician alive, does that make it number one? Over here! Larry finds another survivor, though, named Nadine, played by Laura San Giacomo. You're not gonna shoot me, are you? Dangerous? I don't know. No, no, I'm not dangerous. Okay, word of advice. If you want me to pay attention, don't put Kareem's hilarious corpse eyeballing me in the background. We gotta get out of here. They realize that they don't want to live in a city smelling like dead ass. They should probably leave. Hey, look, it's what my parents said my future would be like. Bum -de -bum -de -bum. Bum -bum -bum. Matt Frewer plays, get this, somebody not very normal, a mentally ill anarchist named Trash Can Man, who blows up pretty much whatever he wants. How do I know he's crazy? The same way everyone's shown to be crazy in this. Wide-angle close-ups. Gonna stick you in the nut hat, Trash! Hey, Trash, why didn't you burn up the school? I get it! French class! Shut up! Like the other survivors, he hears a voice calling out to him, but it's not Mother Abigail. I will place you high in my council's trash. The cult of Grouch has begun. Meanwhile, we see Mother Abigail is so old-fashioned she doesn't even believe in plumbing. So does she clean that? Oh, I'm gonna ignore that for now. As she sits around waiting for a Pure Flix film to be made about her. I hear you, Lord, and I'm in the way of doing your will. But I don't much like it. Well, is it time? <sighs> All right, let's talk about Mother Abigail. The reason I want to dedicate a whole section to her is, well, this might be the only time I've seen a religious person in a King movie or series that's not totally insane. 
Whenever religion is brought up in a king story, it's usually from an extremist or crazy nut who ties in somehow to what the horror element of the story is. So it's bizarre that not only is this a positive religious character in a king story, but it's almost ridiculously positive. What a friend we have in Jesus. As followers flock to her, others flock to this other character named Randall Flagg who's about as evil and demonic as you can get. I got the law to protect me! I ain't scared of the likes of you! For someone who's mocked extreme religious leanings in the past, he leans incredibly hard into them with this series. Are you saying that's a problem, dear child? No, if anything, I'm glad I'm finally seeing variety with King and this subject. Then what be your peeve, my chickadee? It just surprises me that his take on this would be as literal as having a servant of God and a servant of the devil battling for humanity after the apocalypse. Well, just because I say I serve God doesn't mean that it's literally God. Oh, come on, you quote more scripture in this than Bible man. Yes, but that's my interpretation. Flag never says that he's a servant of the devil. I guess that's true. Perhaps there's just a battle between good and evil, and the characters are interpreting it as God and the devil. But there's no other suggestions what it could be, so what else could it be? Lingoliers? Oh, Christ. Turin the Turtle? Really? That comet from Maximum Overdrive. You know what, it's done well, so I should just count my blessings. That's literally what I do every day. Really? Yes. One. Two, <sighs> eleven, pie. I think we're done here. Pumpkin. Speaking of which, an evil presence named Randall Flagg, played by Jamie Sheridan, is breaking survivors out of jail and showing off some pretty cool effects. And you got stuck with nothing to eat but rat tar tar. Bad luck. Look here. I love this guy. He acts like an evil Garth Brooks and looks like Fabio wearing a John Tesh mask. Yeah, there's a lot to do, and we have to work fast. Meanwhile, Larry puts the moves on Nadine, but it looks like she can't go all the way, possibly because she's in cahoots with the Lord of Evil. Man, I thought it'd be the opposite. If God's followers have to be celibate, I assume Satan's followers would have to bang a goat every day or something. Larry, if I stay, we'll end up sleeping together, and I can't have that. Blue balls! Later, we see Nick come across a mentally disabled man named Tom, played by Bill Fagerbaki. I'm sorry, mister, I can't read. I went to school, I made it to the third grade. I, I could read some Curious George when I left, but since then I kind of forgot. So here's the thing about this performance. I don't believe he's mentally disabled for a second. I think of performances from things like What's Eating Gilbert Grape, or Malcolm in the Middle, or even Stephen King's Dreamcatcher. Even though they can be funny too, they still seem believable and work within the reality created for them. Tom is played more dim. That could be because he's played so many dim characters. And yes, there is clearly a difference in how you play the two. I thought a few decorations would cheer up Main Street. Decoration is my hobby. With that said though, he is still really likable. I feel like this could easily have turned into Simple Patrick the Starfish, but he finds the charm and even respect for the character that, while I don't believe is disabled, is still enjoyable to be around. M-O-O-N. That spells hobby. Oh, except for this gimmick. M-O-O-N. That spells ready. Yeah, that's the joke. He can't read, so he spells everything M-O-O-N. It kind of plays a part later, but trust me, it's not worth hearing it a million times. M-O-O-N. That spells Tom Cullen. M-O-O-N. That spells deaf and dumb. M-O-O-N. That spells Tom Cullen. M-O-O-N. That spells parade. M-O-O-N. That spells Tukin. M-O-O-N. That spells hot. M-O-O-N. That spills red. M-O-O-N. That spills the Oh my bad. god, shut up! Anyway, Stu comes across an old man named Glenn, played by Ray Walston, who both have been dreaming about Mother Abigail. And eh, not like that. I don't think. And decide against their better judgment, it might be worth traveling to find her. So I'm gonna go to Nebraska. You wanna come with me? Why not? Well, you don't sound very enthusiastic. Well, I am leaving a safe, spacious, beautiful house in the middle of the apocalypse. You know, fuck you, I'm staying. You hear that? But Rhinestone Cowboy and Eglantine Price stumble across them and discover, hey, they're off to see the wizard too! But Harold doesn't want to go with them. I don't like the looks of them. 
this one in particular. Can I talk to you for a second? I want to do a puppet show for you. It's called Fisty Meets Face. They eventually agree, and meanwhile, Nick and Tom come across their own strange visitor, played by Shawnee Smith. Oh, somebody finally shows up in this crappy town and it turns out to be a deaf mute. That's as funny as the writer of this review not seeing the Saw sequel so he can't make a joke about me in them. Get over here. Hmm, is that a gun in your pocket or... Oh, for once it is a gun. No, 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 what's that? He's just a retard. He doesn't feel things the way that you and I do. I'll just say it. You know how Jack Gleason played a villain so well that people actually started to hate this poor actor? I friggin' despise this bitch. She is just so mean and so dumb. I don't want medicine, mister. That's just poison. No, oh, sir. His daddy said don't do it. Don't make him do it. This actress plays her so well, I feel like my fist would stop centimeters from her face if she ever did this annoying laugh. <laughs> Big I must have that cry just like a baby. What? I don't care if even his slaps are poorly choreographed. I need to see that again. Ouch! You and your stupid freak friend, I'm gonna get both of you guys. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Shoot me with your gun, Jesus! <laughs> Whatever death she has in this needs to be slower. <laughs> and less power rangey. Nick and Tom come across another driver heading to Mother Abigail and arrive soon after. Meanwhile, I think we missed a scene. It's his appendix right there. He's dead, Stu. Oh. Yeah, for a six hour series, a lot of things are surprisingly happening off screen in the middle of it. They come across other travelers. I guess one of them needs surgery, Stu learned how to do surgery? Actually, what even was his job, the more I think about it. Fran gets pregnant with Stu's baby, she breaks up with Harold, which granted we see that part, but I never did see if they were going out or not. Larry becomes romantically interested with someone else he comes across, they get married, and four years pass with Tom Hanks still on the island. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff that happened there! They do show us that a lot of the main characters find Mother Abigail, who's now moved to Colorado. As for everything else, I guess there just wasn't enough time to show it. But you know what there is time for? The entire national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's The hell am I doing? Yeah, no joke. They sing all of the national anthem in this scene. Also, did Nick finally give Tom his heart? How's this work? Okay, okay, to the series credit, it is still acted well, and we get an idea of what the new characters added are like very quickly. Truth be told, in a strange way, I do enjoy seeing most of the town meeting as tons of survivors follow the vision of Mother Abigail and are trying to figure out how to start over. Again, it's a little corny, but it feels warm and real somehow. However, things suddenly go awry when Mother Abigail disappears. Mother Abigail! God, everybody give her some air, uh, okay, or do that, thanks. Boy, that's so strange. So why did you leave, Mother Abigail? Oh, God. Mother Abigail, where did you go? Oh, I'm sorry, I was just cleaning my outhouse. <laughs> plumbing is of the devil, you know. Wait, plumbing is? Yes, and so is football. Football? So are turkeys, knee socks, and peoples whose earlobes connect to their necks. Okay, why was I following you again? Because I'm a wise old black woman you dreamt about. So that makes you a radio to God? I think so. Maybe. Hey, Mother Abigail, do you prefer green dresses or blue dresses? Let me ask God. Hello, God? What dresses do I like? Got it. I'll have the soup. Got it. Do you have any soup dresses? Any other year, this might be odd. Okay, so this week's sponsorship is going to be a little different. They were asking me to talk about a movie that I actually already saw and really enjoyed, so I kind of wanted to give you my personal take so you know I'm not making it up. It's called The Social Dilemma on Netflix, and it's about these uh, people that worked in big tech industries that discuss how they use your data 
for profit. When your data is being harassed so billionaires can become even richer, you should probably draw the line there. And that's why I use, and you should use, ExpressVPN. Every time you use the internet, big tech companies mine your data by tracking your searches, messages, and video history. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, it hides your IP address, which websites can use to personally identify you. That makes your activity more difficult to trace and sell to advertisers. You should still be careful with what you share on social media. Again, you should really, really see this movie, but ExpressVPN makes your web browsing a lot more anonymous. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and prying eyes. Many VPNs slow down your internet, but not ExpressVPN. It's incredibly fast and easy to use. Just one tap and you're protected. If you don't like the idea of tech companies exploiting your personal information, then visit expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic right now and you can get three months of ExpressVPN Extra for free. That's expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic to protect your data and get three months extra for free. Yeah, I know this one's a lot more straightforward, but that's what they're asking for in terms of talking about the movie, and it really is a good movie, guys. You should check it out. Um, yeah, sorry this one wasn't more silly. Um... I'm Cabbage. That should do it. Go to expressvpn.com slash nostalgiacritic to learn more. Like our videos? Subscribe to be notified about them. Want to actually be notified about them? Click on that bell as well. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitch. Playing some games, telling some jokes, and overall having a good time. Hope to see you there. So a committee is formed, comprised of, well, our main characters. And their first concern is keeping an eye on Randall Flagg, who's apparently building an army in Vegas with all the rotten people who survived. So they agree to send in spies. They decide to send a judge, played by Ozzie Davis, one of the villagers named Dana, and... Tom? We want you to go west. Can you do that? Yes, Tom knows west. Yeah, they hypnotize him to remember all the details and send him into the middle of the most dangerous place in the world. That seems douchey. Here's the thing. It's revealed later that Flagg has a hard time reading his mind because his brain is so simple. So it does work out. But they didn't seem to know that! For all we can see, they're sending in the dumbest gargoyle towards a gargoyle eating sun! Even Sinise has a look like! Well, I didn't think I'd be doing of mice and men twice. I will definitely miss you more than Malkovich, I can tell you that. See you later, alligator! After a while, crocodile! Tom only pawn in Game of Life. But Nadine finds her way to town, and when she finds Larry seeing another woman, she's told by Flag to move in on Harold. I saw you at the meeting the other night. Don't even think about leaving. One minute in, that's a new record for me to miss my ex. You're a virgin. I am too. And I'm gonna stay that way. But we can still do things. Everything but that one thing, and it's such a little thing, really. How do you know it's a little thing? I just got a vibe everything about you is a little thing. <laughs> and absent friends. Come on, let's make like Spielberg's War of the Worlds and not Climax. Meanwhile, Tom gets a job in Vegas with the cop from Sleepwalkers. There comes Johnny with his pecker in his hand. He's a one ball man and he's off to the rodeo. I would have played that clip even if he wasn't in this. But later we see Harold has a plan to blow up the committee. Don't screw with my disco, Nadine. Let me make a suggestion. My little disco queen. Take a walk. Harold is like George McFly if Marty never went back in time. You just know he was gonna blow up something somewhere. But Mother Abigail returns bloody and in pain. Oh my god, it's her. Sorry, I heard Vegas was in this movie and as an old person, I had to go. Use this. It's perfectly accurate. Uh, Nadine, just tell me when it's 9.15. Until then, keep your yap shut. You hold on to him, Nadine, and never let go. Harold places the bomb in the house, but by the time they discover it, not everybody is able to get out in time. I am literally about to explode. <gasps> what, I'm dead and you put me in the drapes from Sound of Music? Why am I here? To do God's will, child. Neither one of us is gonna have any more to do with your killer God! In hindsight, both in print and reality, God does seem a little kill-heavy. She says they have to make a stand, putting all their faith in God, and four of them must go on a journey to defeat Flag. Is what God wants of you. Stand. Uh, I move we say screw God and invest in guns all in favor. Aye. Aye. But wait a minute, Mother Abigail, where did you go? Why did you go? And how did it help anything? Well, 
I'll go into great detail about that. <gasps> Mother Abigail? Mother Abigail? No! Mother Abigail! What was that? Oh yeah, that's the funeral home coming to take her away. Already? Yeah, what do you think I've been doing this whole time? I've been preparing her funeral. But how did you know? Because she's all of Stephen King's tropes in one character. The stand doesn't have as many King cliches, so he pretty much shoved them all into Mother Abigail. The wise old black person, the out-of-nowhere psychic, the folksy speaker, the simple good against complicated evil. And, of course, killing off the black supporting role. Really? Dude, the minute she showed up, I knew she was dead. Huh. With the exception of the religious zealot, you're right. She's pretty much a one-person Stephen King drinking game. <laughs> Good eye, Tamara. Oh, that reminds me. How tall are you? Oh, six foot. Thank you. No problem. The four chosen set off on their quest, even their little dog, too. While Harold seems to be top of the world. Oh, I do hope something one part nasty, one part hilarious happens to him. That'll do. Little Red Killing Hood leaves him to die, while one of their spies comes across a disturbing image. Well, at least their rehab clinic is strict. One of the trademarks of Mick Garris' projects is he likes to put other horror directors in as actors. So here's Alfred Hitchcock. That was him! Come on, he's getting away! He and another assassin are told to take out the spy, but to do so without bloodying him up too much. Asking Sam Raimi to hold back on blood is like asking a celebrity not to tweet about politics. It's kind of impossible. You in a heap of trouble, son. Ah! To quote what you said to Bruce Campbell, this is what's best for the picture. Flag also figures out Dana's a spy. Either that or he's mad she didn't hide the mics better in her scenes. And he calls her up to talk to her. Your old black witch is dead. Your people are in confusion. That's it, dude. You mean I can just go? Oh, there is one more thing. It's my death, isn't it? <laughs> Garris, your sleepwalkers is showing. Dana falls on a shard of glass, leading to one of my favorite reactions. Uh, bitch. <laughs> Uncle Freddy took over writing for that bit there. Nadine returns to Flag, and she discovers sex with the devil isn't as fulfilling as she thought it would be. We are dead. This is hell. I heard they said that every day on the set of Carrie 2. He reveals that Nadine is pregnant while his second-in-command, Lloyd, played by Miguel Ferrer, says they know who the third spy is, but he might have gotten away. Ah. And you let me go upstairs without telling me I could pop your neck like a dick and snap into a Slim Jim! Your seed is cold. Nadine decides she's jumping for two, and where director Raimi was perfectly cast as a bumbling hick, director John Landis is not exactly a badass mercenary. You know, I thought there'd be whores. <laughs> That's what he said when he demanded payment for Blues Brothers 2000. What was that? You look like Leonard Moulton with a pop gun. Stop trying to act cool! Meanwhile, our four travelers come across a massive hill, so Stu decides to see if it's stable. I told you! Piece of cake! Uh, piece of cake! 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 Piece of shit. <laughs> Stu breaks his leg, and rather than taking him with, they decide to leave him behind. Why? Because it's God's will. It's God's plan. Shut up about God! If he wants me to eat, he'll send food. If he wants me to drink, he'll send rain. You know, for a guy who crapped on religion several times, this is having a bit of a war room feel, isn't it? He's eventually saved by Tom, but the remaining three turn themselves in, and one of them is shot by Lloyd. It's all right, Mr. Henry. You don't know any better. I would have been in Mr. Magoo for the money, too. Not gonna lie, I thought a Stephen King story would feature a guy called Ratman a lot more than it is. One less Ratman in the world. Shut up that honky voodoo. He still makes every moment count. The other two are dragged out in front of a crowd to be made an example of. This ain't how Americans act! We gotta stop this! <laughs> Kinda wondering what the crowd's reaction to that is because they've never seen that before. <laughs> wow! Uh, I didn't know he could do that, honey. Did you? I think so? Bump, 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 bump. The big one! 
but Deadpool comes in to close things out as it looks like he's acquired one of Flag's nuclear weapons, and... Well, this is a King story, and to his credit, this isn't an awful ending, it's just... bad. Sorry. The hand of God. I want to hear the laugh of Master Ham from Smash Brothers that looks so fake. <laughs> up the missile because, let's face it, the author of Left Behind is writing this now, as Tom and Stu watch from afar. Well, we should be blind. The next plot point seems so out of nowhere with only eight minutes remaining, I'll just let the writer himself explain it to you. It's the baby. It's come early, and it's got the flu. I get the idea of this religious battle ending with a newborn fighting to be in this new world, but... Six hours, man. Wrap it up. You could have had her going through this struggle while you were building up the Midas hand, jerking off the atom bomb. You can multitask, man. I think the baby's gonna live. Thankfully, it is pretty short at the end, and the baby, of course, ends up surviving, and if we didn't have that scene, we might have missed out on this. Peek, baby. <laughs> oh my god! Ain't you beautiful? Just as gorgeous as dawn and evening. Again, in another King miniseries, this would just be par the course, but because this one is pretty damn good, scenes like this are just so friggin' funny. <laughs> Even the dog's giving a look like, What the rock is that? Yes, it becomes playing with fire for a millisecond. We saw Lonesome Dove end like this, so we figure it might trigger some Emmys. Ooh, it worked. Do you think people can change? I don't know. Maybe she does. Hey, if King can write a serious version of Dogma, anything's possible. And that was The Stand. Like any King miniseries, it has its corny moments, but honestly, it's pretty good. A lot of that, I think, comes down to the acting. The majority of performers sell the hell out of this. This is a project that so easily could have been too ridiculous and over the top, but this surprisingly finds a good balance so that it doesn't come across like God's Not Dead 5. The characters are interesting, the pacing is steady, and it remarkably keeps your attention. Despite it being six hours, I was never bored. So yeah, I know it sounds strange saying a King series about the rapture with a pro-God message is actually pretty decent, but it truly is. Check it out and see why it's deserving of all the attention. Gritty. Mother Abigail? You've done well, Gritty. You've put aside your compulsion to mock writers more talented than you and acknowledge their good works. Thanks, Mother Abigail. That means a lot coming from you. Really? No, I don't know why I said that. Well, enjoy your nostalgia week, child. I'm playing rummy with the cast of little rascals up here. Really? How are they? Drunk, mostly. Well, that's sad. Bye. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it. Thank you, Tamara. Shut up that honky voodoo. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and once again doing a charity that ties into uh, battling uh, COVID-19 and helping those uh, with it. So this week we are doing the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association. Kind of a mouthful. <laughs> uh, this association is dedicated to eradicating uh, the eradication of autoimmune diseases and the alleviation of suffering. Uh, they are dedicated to fighting this through fostering and facilitating and facilitating collaboration in the areas of education, public Public awareness, research, and patient services uh, in both uh, effective, ethical, and efficient manner. Uh, now, older adults with underlying medical conditions are at higher risk of getting COVID, of course, most of us know that. So they prepare people with uh, autoimmune diseases to take appropriate precautions and do everything they can to help them out. Uh, not only, you know, with this autoimmune, uh, you know, related diseases, but with COVID as well, because that definitely falls under it. So uh, you can check them out. You can uh, donate. Uh, 
again, spreading the link always helps. Uh, just the, the tiniest little bit you can do to help just to get awareness out there of, uh, you know, the good that people are doing and uh, ways that other good people can help. So definitely spread the word if you can. Or if you do have money to donate, please do that too. Uh, you can volunteer as well. Look into it. Uh, it's a really, really good organization. It has four stars on Charity Navigator. Definitely check them out. Thank you so much.